Hey everyone, um, I see several of you are here. Can everybody hear me okay? You should be able to uh, join the group chat and um, hopefully over to the right hand side you'll be able to um, type in your questions. And if somebody could just let me know that everything is working and you can hear me, then we will get started. Let me see here. I'm not sure if I can see. Okay, I'm starting to see viewers. I think there are four of you here, six. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the workshop. I'm so glad that you guys uh, joined. Uh, we're actually one of the first big groups on Skillshare to do a workshop. They're relatively new, a uh, new concept for them. So we're kind of testing out the platform and seeing how well it works for everyone. And um, so far, I have just really enjoyed it and being able to connect directly with um, more of you kind of in a more intimate setting. And it's just been really, really fun for me. So I hope that you guys are enjoying it too. And if you have any feedback uh, for us along the way, I hope that you give that to us. Um, can somebody just type something in the group chat to let me know that it's working? Um, hopefully over on the right hand side you should be able to say like hello or, or ask questions um, over in the chat box. Anybody? I'm going to type hello over here. and see if you guys are seeing that okay. This is really my first um, Google Hangout on air, so I just want to make sure that I know that everything's working. Okay, great. I think that it's working because I see something from Alex. Hey, Alex. Alex says, I wanted to ask your advice on designing patterns specifically for clothing, as that's what I'm most excited about. Designing a collection for fashion rather than fabric. Um, okay, thank you, Sheila. Um, yeah, Alex, I'm not um, really up to date on this since I don't really design with the fashion industry in mind, even though my fabrics do end up being used for clothing. Um, it's not necessarily like, you know, um, it's not starting out as fashion related. So I do think that you probably design a little differently. Um, uh, collections would probably be less important than say for a quilting collection. And you would probably also, uh, your scale would probably be different. Um, so something that'll be really useful for you is to mock up um, actual outfits and make sure that the scale is something that is exactly what you would want for say a pair of pants or a shirt or something uh, like that. But that's really all, all kind of the advice I have because I don't really design for uh, fashion specifically in mind. Um, hey, Lenore. So I don't know, Alex, if you have a follow-up question, feel free to... Um, to ask me. I'm not sure if I was very helpful there on that one. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to let you guys um, ask your questions in the Q&A section as you uh, want to. And yeah, maybe mention they have... Okay, yeah, I think you do have to do that. There's a QA. and a um, you have to change the little boxes to Q&A from showcase. So you probably are in the showcase uh, viewing and you need to check Q&A to be able to um, type in your questions over in the, in the chat box. Yeah, I do think, um, Sarah, I'm answering your question, uh, whether or not fabrics tend to do well with textures. And I do think that they do well with textures. Um, I think it's probably not what you see most often because textures are a little harder to accomplish. Um, in Illustrator, it's more of a Photoshop thing. 
but you can definitely achieve them in Illustrator using um, brushes and standard textures and things like that. And so I, um, in my last collection called Succulents, I actually um, played with a lot of textures in that collection and tried to add more of this, um, you know, less of a, of a flat, um, illustrations and adding more texture to them and I think that it went really well so I think it just depends on you know what you are striving for as a designer but I think that it could definitely do well in um, on on fabrics um, Sheila says where would I find mock-ups for curtains to get the impression of how the design is working um, well there's a couple of different things you could do you could basically just mock up your own uh, curtain in Illustrator and put your pattern on it. And then what you would do is um, know like the, there's a standard size for a curtain. So you could um, make your document that size, which would be huge, but then size it down using a percentage. So say 25%. Um, and then when you're working with your patterns, you know that they're at a 25% scale and that 100% scale would be perfect for the curtain, say, or something like that. Um, you can also find mock-ups online, and I'm sure there's uh, lots of um, curtain mock-ups that you could use for that as well. Let me see. I'm still getting used to the Q&A box over here, so let me try to go through your questions here. Um, I am selecting Shirley's. Is the fabric industry too full of florals? <laughs> I hope not. I love working with holiday designs, fabrics for Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's. Are they hard sell for fabric companies? Um, I uh, Hopefully the fabric industry will never be too full of florals because that's basically what I tend to gravitate towards all the time. Um, but there's definitely room for holiday designs, Halloween designs, holidays yeah, of, all, of all kinds. Um, what you need to keep in mind is that the market is significantly smaller for those. And so also from a company's perspective, their profit margin is also going to be significantly smaller for those. Because if somebody uh, decides to sign on an entire Christmas line, then there's a really small uh, window for the year that that's going to be a big seller. Same for Valentine's Day or Halloween or whatever. So I think that that's why companies probably are less likely to um, take on really specific holiday um, patterns. Not to say that there's not a market for them because some companies um, specifically focus on holiday, um, you know, themes or whatever. So it just depends on choosing what company you choose and if you align with what they're, what they're going for. Does that help, Shirley? Okay, Lenore, I'm wondering if working with original artwork in Photoshop is a good idea or should all the artwork be vectorized using Illustrator? Um, this is touching on a point that several people have um, brought up in class. This kind of hand-drawn feel that they are missing in Illustrator, not hand-drawn, but um, hand-painted and watercolor with a lot of textures. And so what I want to tell you is just that it's completely dependent on how you work as an artist and also completely dependent on the companies that you're striving to work with. So in the fabric industry, I can't work with watercolors um, and original painting so much because of the way that the mill prints the fabric. It has to be um, a standard number of colors and paints you know, using watercolors and things like that give you hundreds of colors per document. So I, um, though I can achieve kind of a watercolor effect, I tip, I, I really can't, you really can't do that in Illustrator. So um, Photoshop is where you go for that. And there are, for things like the paper industry and the wallpaper industry, things that get printed using um, traditional printing methods that can handle hundreds or thousands of colors, then you'll be totally fine to use Photoshop. Um, a great example, for this is the artist Katie Daisy. Are you guys familiar with Katie? She and I are good friends and she works completely, she's a watercolor artist and she works completely in Photoshop and she's um, very, very successful and of course all of her clients um, are happy with her Photoshop files and that's, that's uh, absolutely what she has to do in order to achieve the effect of her watercolor 
um, prints. So it just depends on what industry you're uh, focusing on and where you want to go. I'm just going to work my way down the list here. Another one from, this one's from Melissa. How do you make a perfect tile for Spoonflower and do you export your tiles from Illustrator or do you have to bring them into Photoshop like Spoonflower? Um, I don't work in Photoshop at all. I work in Illustrator for nearly everything that I do. And so there are several different ways to um, make a tiling square for Spoonflower, but this is probably my, um, this is how I do it and probably the most straightforward way to do it is that when you have your um, repeating tile on Illustrator, you will have an, you'll most likely have an artboard and then the background to your pattern. If you make a copy of your background and make it, turn it into an artboard and then delete all the other artboards so that your artboard and the background um, tile of your repeat are the same exact size, then you can save that and upload your Illustrator file directly to Spoonflower, and it always gives me really excellent results. Um, so that's how I do that. I'm gonna read for just a second here. Okay, let's go here. Uh, this is from Alex. I was interested to hear about you going to trade fairs and making appointments once you had a portfolio together. Are those trade fairs useful for different industries as well as fabric? Um, yeah, definitely. I think every um, major industry will have a trade show. So my major industry is fabric, and so I went to quilt market. But every industry, stationery, homewares, fashion, they all have industry trade shows. And so if you can go, then they give a unique opportunity where every art director basically every art director for every company that you might be interested in signing with is there under one roof. So I was able to make appointments with several of them with my portfolio in hand and meet them all within a three day period at, at Quilt Market. And that's um, how I got started. So I would definitely recommend that um, if you can find the, there are even smaller trade shows or the larger trade shows um, and then another thing that you could consider is showcasing at something like Print Source or Surtex. And those work a little differently. Uh, that's where surface pattern designers go and have their own booth with your own work in it. And the people who walk the floor there um, are companies of all different kinds who want to designers. They need artwork for their product of all, all different kinds of products. Um, so that's another route to go. It's it's very expensive to showcase at either of those, but um, I've heard that it's and I and I've shown it that it's a really good experience. Okay, let's do. Um, Sarah says, I find illustrator designs easier than geometrics. Do you have any tips on how I can improve on geometrics? Um, geometrics are totally different, but they are fun to work with. And I typically just work on, ge if they're true geometrics with straight lines and, um, you know, mathematical angles, then I uh, work on them directly within Illustrator. And if you watch... Um, I believe it's the second way that I make patterns in, in the first Skillshare class, two different ways to make patterns. The second one, um, you kind of place your motifs on a board and then draw your um, repeating background. And that is how I generally work with geometrics um, so that I can get it even and I'm not trying to match something to an artboard. Instead, I match the repeating box to the geometrics after I place them on the board, if that makes sense. Um, so I would just start with start with just making a simple like hexagon honeycomb print and st start exploring from there. And geometrics are, are a lot of fun to work with, um, especially if you get into rotating things at a mathematical angles and things like that. They can be fun. <laughs> Good, uh, Kate. I'm glad you figured it out. I'm sorry if it was confusing. Um, let's see. Where would I find mock-ups for curtains to get the impression of how the design is working? Sheila, um, I'm going to direct you to Elizabeth Owen's class on Skillshare. Um, Elizabeth is another good friend of mine, and she teaches surface pattern design as well. But her latest class on Skillshare is 
um, exactly on mock-ups and she does a great job of explaining how to draw your own mock-ups as well as where to find mock-ups online. So I would suggest just popping over and taking her class. It's pretty short. Um, it's the very last one that she did, I believe. Carrie says, the lines of my drawings are coming in with paths on both sides instead of solid strokes. It's a pain to fill them in after I fill them thick black lines on both sides of the artwork. Um, I might need to see a picture of that, Carrie. Um, lines in my drawings are coming in with paths on both sides. Are you, this might be more of a conversation. Um, are you scanning them in? Are you live tracing them? Um, instead of solid strokes. There, I'm certain that I can help you, but I think I need to um, see a picture of what you're talking about, Carrie. So let's um, connect maybe after class in the discussion board or we can email each other, but take a screenshot and send it over to me so I can see exactly what you're talking about. Okay, Kira, hey Kira. Are there industry standards for how many prints in a pattern and how many colorways when presenting a portfolio to manufacturers? I think probably every industry is different. Um, for the quilting, I can speak from the quilting industry. The quilting industry, I, uh, well, every company is a little different too, but I would say in general, every company does collections of eight to 12 prints and offer those eight to 12 prints in two different colorways. So for art gallery fabrics, I do 10 prints offered in two different colorways. So there's 20 SKUs in each collection. And most other fabric companies fall along the same lines, like eight to 12. So when you're presenting in a portfolio, as long as you're somewhere in that range, um, then I think that you'll have plenty to show them. Let's see. Okay. Um, this is from Marie. When you're working with a client, how long does it usually take from start to finish to develop a collection? Um, I generally, I, this may not be exactly how I work. I don't really work with clients on a, um, like uh, to, I don't really work to a brief with clients. I usually, work and then make my work available to to for for licensing so i usually am working kind of to my own deadline i mean the i definitely have deadlines with the fabric industry and that those come twice a year so it usually takes me roughly four to six months to work on a on a full collection but for my other licensing designs um it's just kind of all over the board um so the i'm not really the best person I don't think to ask that question because I don't really work that way even though some surface pattern designers do they take on freelance work from a client to client basis uh, but I generally don't do that so I really can't speak to it I'm sorry <laughs> Let's see, this one is from Sarah. Are you planning on doing a blog hop linked to this workshop? I did one before with another of your courses and it was fun. Yeah, we did that for Creative Live. Um, that is a good question. Maybe I'll pop that over into the discussions board and see how many workshop students are um, bloggers as well because that's kind of something I run into is a lot of people don't really have blogs um, that want to do that. But if there's enough people, say, at least 10 to 15 people who want to do a blog hop, that would be really fun. So I'll pop that, let me jot that down. I'll ask that question in the discussions board later for a blog hop. Okay, great idea, thanks. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, okay, I think I'm up to date on your guys' questions. So I have a whole bunch from the discussions board that I'm going to go through. And then if you, um, if you uh, have any more questions, then just pop them over in the questions board. Okay, so this one is from Jennifer. She says, do you ever use royal royalty-free images and shapes in your designs, or do you draw everything um, that I do? Personally, I draw everything that I do. Um, there are royalty-free images and shapes out there. 
Um, so it might be worth exploring, but I don't have firsthand experience with this, but I'm guessing that art directors are going to prefer to see um, all original artwork, even though that this is something that you could do and definitely something you could do for your own personal use. Um, but if you're trying to license with a company, I, I would err on the side of um, doing everything yourself. Um, let's see. Do you, cre do you create completely for yourself or do art directors put out something they're looking for? So there are definitely two ways to work. And I um, decided early on that I wanted to basically uh, create all my work completely and then make it available for licensing. However, the flip side to that is to put yourself out there as a surface pattern designer and then um, take on freelance work. And that way you would be working to a client's uh, brief most likely. And so not that you couldn't stay true to a, you know, to your signature style, but I feel like I can stay true to um, my work a little better if I just create it and then make it available. That way I know that I'm loving what I'm working on and I'm inspired to work on it and I'm not working to somebody else's brief or deadline. That's just total per personal preference. Um, I know people who are successful doing it both ways, but that's personally how I work. Okay, Sheila, when you are when you choose a theme for a collection of your own, do you always have in mind what is very commercial? Go with something you are passionate about. Um, this is a great question, and it's not black and white. It's definitely a case by case situation. Um, so, I never go with a trend that doesn't feel. Um, I guess the answer would be that is that I I try to stick to the, only the things that I'm very passionate about. However, if there is a trend that is also in line with my passions, then I will kind of take it and run with it as well. Um, but, you know, just because a color is the Pantone color of the year, I don't necessarily use it if it doesn't speak to me or what I'm working on. Um, so trends are important, but I don't hop on trends unless they are already aligned with uh, what I really want to do in my work and where I'm, where I'm headed. Okay, the next question is how would you advise someone just starting out to approach manufacturers to hopefully get a contract? Again, this is going to be different um, depending on who you're approaching. And I also, you, you've probably taken it, but I've also done a third class on Skillshare about um, portfolios. And I go into great detail about how to approach manufacturers and how to contact them and how to even find them in the first place. So I would suggest taking that, um, but beyond that, I would just say that a lot of these companies get just hundreds of portfolios. Sometimes they get hundreds in even a given week. So my advice is to basically stand out from the crowd. Just go above and beyond what you think the standard is. And in my opinion, the standard is probably a lot of emails and a lot of um, binders, you know, kind of plastic binders with plastic sheets <laughs> that you put your work in. And so I talk a lot about going above and beyond and just really putting a lot of love into what you're presenting so that they can feel that. And um, since they're not going to be face to face with you, you want to portray who you are as an artist to them through your work that they're either looking at or holding in their hands. So um, I also call companies and I have gotten feedback that really nobody does that anymore and that it's much appreciated to pick up the phone and call companies and ask for their art director and speak with them over the phone is not really something that's comfortable for any, I, I really, it's not, it's very uncomfortable, <laughs> but it's something that doesn't um, happen very often. And so I feel like it stands out a little bit. So the, that's just a couple of pointers on how to uh, approach manufacturers. The next question is from Jennifer. She says, do you ever include generic prints in your collections? For example, a simple polka dot, a stripe, a check, etc." And yes, I absolutely do. Um, this is a little unique to the quilting industry. So when I have a collection of 10 prints, I always include focal point prints, 
medium scale prints and then simple generic prints. And that is because quilters and sewers need that nice array of simple and complex prints. So they need simpler prints for things like quilt binding and maybe collar edging on a, on a blouse or the lining of a bag and then more complex prints for bigger projects like bags and, and larger uh, areas on a quilt and things like that. Not to say that, that uh, that's really helpful in any collection because if you don't include some simpler um, pieces, then the collection as a whole is going to read as really busy and hectic. And so even industries like the stationary industry can use those simpler prints to their advantage, like little polka dots for, um, say, the, you know, the inside of a notebook or something like that. So I always suggest including simpler prints in your, um, in your collections as well. Okay, Leslie asks, what size artboard do you work on when making a repeat, and at what scale should your main motifs be? Uh, again, the, the glory of Illustrator is that things are always uh, scalable, endlessly scalable to smaller or larger. So I don't give a lot of thought to my, um, you know, my repeat size until honestly everything's done. The, the scale is the last thing that I work on. Um, so, but in general, to answer your question, in general, I work on a board um, maybe that's a thousand by a thousand pixels or 800 by 800 pixels. And then when I sketch, um, I do try to sketch large enough to where I get, I can get a really good scan if I go over it, uh, which is usually say like the size of the palm of my hand, if it's a floral motif or something like that. So you don't have to go uh, super large, but I would say three or four inches for a main motif. And, and then from there you can scale up or down um, as many times as you need to. Um, let's see. I'm just checking over here to see if any of you have asked questions. Yeah. Sarah, do you find that you are drawn to similar color palettes and how many colors do you commonly work with? What color are you loving at the moment? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do find myself. Um, in fact, I try to fight to get away from the color palette that I'm constantly drawn to just to give some more um, depth to my work. So I am super drawn to pastels and pinks all the time. Um, and the color that I'm loving most at the moment is mint. I that kind of green light minty color. I am. I keep trying to incorporate in all, all my work. Um, so I do try to maintain. Even though I try to introduce new colors into my work, I try to maintain um, kind of the same level of quality of color, if that makes sense. So that it's expected you know it would be unexpected for me to throw in some really bright neons or something like that so you know I try to um, do something that is expected but different at the same time okay Melissa if I wanted to approach different industries do you suggest I make a separate portfolio for each for example a portfolio with watercolor patterns for wallpaper and a portfolio for illustrator drawn patterns for fabric you know, you could do that, but I think that uh, you could easily put them all in the same portfolio. Uh, that way you um, won't have to keep them separate depending on the industry. I think that you could make sections in your portfolio for your watercolor patterns or Photoshop work and then something for um, fabric because you never know when an industry is going to be able to use um something that you didn't expect them to be able to use especially with all the all like constantly new printing um, technology and things like that so I would suggest maybe putting them all in the same portfolio and that would be even a simpler approach um, from your from your end okay um, let's see I answered that one Adriana says how many colors per print do you usually use um, when I start a collection, I usually try to start with 10 to 12 or 8 to 12 colors. Sometimes those creep up towards um, 18 or 20 colors per collection. It just depend, depends on how de uh, detailed and complex the collection ends up being. But I, I start with 10 or 12 um, concrete colors that I want to work with. And then I take away and add and change kind of... Um, in an organic process throughout uh, completing a collection. So definitely under 20, though, in, in most all cases. 
Okay, um, Emma says, I'm a little confused about expand and when to use the shape builder versus unite in the Pathfinder tab. Do these result in the same effect or allow different coloring options? Um, so there, if you, if you'll learn this if you don't know it yet. There's like 10 or 15 ways to do the same thing in Illustrator almost all the time. <laughs> you can choose this way or that way. Sometimes they uh, do allow for different coloring options, but sometimes they just provide several ways to do the same thing. So in my perspective, the Shape Builder tool and the Unite tool and the Pathfinders tab do the exact same thing. It is just um, dependent on how you're working and, and how uh, best fits the particular project that you're working on. I use both almost equally depending on, um, you know, when you use the shape builder, this would be easier if you could, I could share my screen or something. But when I use the shape builder, I usually have plenty of room around my motif so that I can drag that line through all the shapes that I want to combine. And then when I'm working on more detailed um, objects, I tend to use the unite feature just because I can go in and select specifically what I want. The other reason that I use the Unite a lot is when I want to unite, say, everything on my artboard that's the same color, I can select everything that's, say, black and then unite them all together if I've been drawing with a bunch of little shapes or something. And then I think that the expand using Expand has been confusing to a lot of people. Um, typically, I I'm trying to think, but I believe the only time I use Expand is after I've colored something with the photo, uh, with the paint bucket tool. The paint bucket tool um, allows you to color in shapes that you've drawn, say, with the block brush tool or something. Um, so the, the paint bucket tool is really helpful in, in being able to color in um, motifs quickly but it, it is almost like an effect applied to the motif, and so it can make your document sluggish. So after I've used the paint uh, bucket tool, I always expand my objects. So that is really the only time I use expand, and I hope that helps. Okay, Rose has a couple of questions. Um, do you have any advice on fine tuning or controlling the recolor artwork tool? Uh, yes, I do. And but then you you go on rows to talk about locking the brightness of a color so the shadows and the highlights stay put and also the hue. So um, I do have to say that I don't use the recolor artwork tool with the hue to change the hues. Um, I find that I, it pretty much never gives me any result that I was actually looking for. You can use the recolor artwork tool to make things darker or lighter, um, but to me it's really really random and I don't prefer using it. I like to go in with a color palette that I know that I like and then just use it to change the colors in my uh, predetermined color palette around. Mm -hmm. But one thing, um, and I have made a video on this, so I might just post um, the little tutorial for you guys rather than try to explain it, but if you go into the recolor artwork tool, there's a little dash beside the colors, and if you click on that, it turns into an arrow and it locks that color in place. So say you know for sure, for sure that you want the background to be cream or mint or whatever color, and you want to play with all the colors of the motifs on top of it, you can go in and lock the background color and then rotate through the options for the motifs on top of it. Um, so if somebody will remind me, I will post a link to that video tutorial um, in the workshop for you guys to look at. Rose says, when do we want to rasterize and when do we want to expand? Um, again, that was, I, I think I explained the expand. And then I, re I really never rasterize. So I believe um, when you rasterize, you take whatever you're working on and you turn it into a flattened like JPEG. So I don't know if it's a JPEG, but a flattened image. And so it's basically no longer editable and it's also no longer scalable, endlessly scalable. It'll get grainy if you increase its size. So this might be an option if you're really, really wanting to do, um, for instance, if you use the live trace tool to do a very complicated water coloring and you wanted a lot of colors in it, but then it made your document huge. You might want to play with then rasterizing that illustration to reduce your 
your document size, but know that you will no longer have access to go in and edit that illustration. And, and that's my understanding anyways. Um, and then she says, how do we decrease the number of points in a piece that we use the image trace tool on? Um, you can you can go, I'm going to open Illustrator really quick. I know you can't see this, but you can go under Object. Okay, so you select your illustration, go to Object, and then go to Path, and then select Simplify. And that will uh, allow you to play with simplifying the number of points in the um, illustration. So at first it's going to give you a really wonky result, but if you take it up to like 98% or 95%, you can see that you can uh, reduce the number of anchor points in your illustration significantly. Um, and then if you want to smooth them, you can use the smooth tool and that kind of thing. Okay, I'm going to pop over here and answer some of your live questions. How do you find out what's trending in the quilt market? Are there any modern quilters you would recommend following on social media? Um, good question, Sarah. What, how do you find what's trending? I mean, there are specific ways to find out what's trending, but I just feel like I kind of gather what's trending from social media, you know, Pinterest and Instagram and seeing what other people are doing. And there are definitely waves of trends that come through. Um, but I cannot remember the name of it, but if you're familiar with um, Make It in Design or the art and business of the art, the school, the art and school, the school of art and business of design, something, it's really long. Um, that's by Rachel Taylor. They um, talk a lot about trends and that course, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with it, but it's a big surface pattern design, three modules long. Uh, course and they talk about trends and there are some trending websites that you have to pay to be a part of but they forecast trends so I think if you probably google um, forecasting trends for surface pattern design or fabric design or fashion then you'll you'll find out what I'm talking about are there any modern quilters you would recommend following on social media I mean yeah I'm I'm over there I'm sure you you probably know that and then um, I really love to watch what Leah Duncan is doing, what, um, oh, you put me on the spot and I can't think of everybody's name, but maybe I'll put a list of people that I suggest following on social media over on the discussion board. That would be good. That way I can go through my list and really give you a good answer. Okay. Keisha says, hi, Bonnie, I find it hard to decide how to color artwork. Should I just go with what feels right or color pick from original reference image? Um, start out by going with what feels like feels right. Um, a lot of times when I work on motifs or pattern, I'll kind of, I consider it just kind of throwing color on it. Um, and then after I'm done illustrating is when I go back and really perfect the colors. But the more you work in Illustrator, the more you'll um, get a feel for how you're going to want to later color something it has it'll change the way that you illustrate um and that's really nothing that can be taught either it's just kind of try tri uh, trial and error so i uh i do pick color stories from images a lot um i try to use my own images that usually i've taken in nature because nature will always provide a well-rounded color palette, uh, neutrals and brights and darks and light colors. And so I will start a lot of times with a, a color from um, my garden or outside and start picking colors from there and then, and then working on it from that perspective. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, this one is from Lenore. Is this class available for viewing after it's over? Um, yeah, because life has gotten in the way, and that, that happens to all of us, so don't worry about that one bit. Uh, I will confirm that. I meant to confirm this for you before the workshop, and I forgot, but I am pretty sure that if you are in this workshop, you'll have access to the workshop indefinitely. Um, I don't think that it's going to be closed. I'll double check on that, but I'm almost positive that you'll have endless access to it. So if you are 
one of the people who haven't maybe started the project or haven't been able to keep up with the deadlines, um, that is totally fine. Just work at it, work through it at your own pace. I mean, the only thing that you'll miss out on is the dead, the final deadline, which is where I'll I'll choose um, some people to get a couple of prizes or, or something. Um, but you'll still for completing the workshop workshop, you'll get a certificate from Skillshare, and you can work through it at your own pace with no problem uh, at all. And we'll all still be able to see your work when you when you do get around to it. So. Surely, uh, do you think holiday prints are accepted by fabric companies as much as everyday prints and are our holiday fabrics a risk? <clears throat> I spoke to this a little bit earlier on and I, I, my only advice on this is that <clears throat> you have to, um, you have to think about holiday prints from a company's perspective and it is probably riskier for them because they're going to still have the same manufacturing costs, <clears throat> but technically the market for those prints are gonna be much smaller. However, depending on the company, I mean, some fabric companies solely print uh, holiday short run um, prints and things like that. So just do your research and make sure that whatever you're submitting to a company is in line with their goals and what they're doing as a company. So it's not necessarily something you shouldn't do, just something that you need to be conscious about. Mary says, do you use Digimark watermarks or some other way to protect your images from being copied? Um, I tend to put my logo um, on my artwork anytime I share it online. And this is a this is a huge topic that we could go into uh, for days because there's a um, definitely things are being copied, but I try to not uh, approach my business from a point of, of fear because if I did if I did then I wouldn't be sharing my work and if I'm not sharing my work then people aren't seeing it and so they don't know I exist and they don't know to license me so it's definitely a risk to put your work out there um, it's just kind of a catch-22 because you have to put it out there in order to be recognized um, so I err on the side of sharing your work and putting a tasteful watermark on it. Um, sometimes people tend to put huge watermarks or watermarks that cover the whole thing or, you know, hash marks all over it or something. And this just is really, I find it really distracting, but also from a blocker's perspective, I then can't use that image um, to share on my blog. And I usually won't have the time to go find the source and ask for an image without it not find the source, but take the time to email the owner and see if they'll send me one without the hash marks or whatever. So um, I suggest putting uh, a tasteful um, logo on it somewhere that will still encourage people share to share it, but also let them find out who made it if it does happen to get kind of lost online. Um, and then Mary also asks, what subject matter should be featured in a beginner's designer's collection? florals or holiday, etc. cetera. Um, I think that this is gonna be different for every designer and that you should only feature in your beginner collections. Um, just feature what, just feature whatever's coming out from your heart, really. Just follow your heart and uh, try to stay true to your signature style and share um, in your portfolio what you want to see in the world and that will um, that will read so I, there's not a right answer if you're um, if you love holiday then do holiday if you love florals do florals just do whatever uh, really feels true to yourself and and go with that I don't think there's a right answer for that one Kira says, you mentioned using Pantone color books when submitting to the mill. Is this essential for submitting colorways to companies? Uh, no, it's not essential. In fact, I didn't get, I'll show it to you. Hold on just a second. I. This is a little tip. I'm wearing earphones because Skillshare taught me that the mic on my earphone is much better than the mic on my computer, so I hope I sound okay to you guys, um, but that's why I wear earphones sometimes. This is my uh, fan deck. It's called a fan deck, and I use the color guide for fashion and home. I think maybe it's backwards. 
it's backwards to me. I'm not sure if it's backwards to you, but it's fashion and home color guide for Pantone and it's a fan book. And this one is only about $2.99. This is really one of the most affordable uh, options that go up from there. And I didn't get this Pantone book until after my first contract. So it is essential in order to um, submit to a mill for printing, but it's not essential to um, submit to a company. You can use um, colors that are not Pantone colors. In fact, they won't even know whether they're Pantone colors or not if you've gotten your work printed. The only way they'll know if they're Pantone colors or not is if you are submitting them Illustrator files. And at that point, you should be licensed with them. So um, I don't think anybody needs to invest in it till they have to, is my opinion. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm up to date on you guys' questions. Um, the next one is from Emma. She says, I'd love to know how you organize your files and folders for a collection and which elements are important to keep. When a pattern is designed for a client, which files do they get sent? This is so funny. This is the number one question that I get asked, or, or not the number one question, but the number one class request. <laughs> I, I've gotten so many requests from people to teach a class on on file organization. Would you guys be interested in that? And if so, maybe I'll do a short Skillshare class on that. Um, but in short, it because uh, it is kind of confusing. There's a way you know that you should save your stuff in order to organize it well. Um, so I generally save all. The, and there's also no right answer. But anyways, I generally save my sketches to a document, like for an entire collection, I'll save all my sketches to a document, and then I'll save all my motifs to a document, and then I'll save all my patterns to a document. So, um, I believe I show you this during class, but once you make a pattern, um, and you select the pattern, then the pattern is the fill in the, in the little swatches box, it becomes the fill. And if you take that fill with your mouse and drag and drop it to your artboard, it expands the pattern back to your original repeat. Um, if you don't really understand what I'm saying, just go try it with a swatches with with a pattern swatch that you've already created. Just drag and drop it back over from the swatches panel um, to your artboard, and it expands it to your original repeat. And it also saves it just like you first drug it over there to make your pattern. Um, so everything that you had grouped is still grouped and everything, uh, all the motifs just like you had done done them, built them, because I like to build my patterns in a particular way and group certain things together, is all uh, maintained. So I generally don't keep anything after that except for the pattern itself because the pattern contains all the motifs that I've already done. So I don't save all the individual motifs. I just save the final patterns and know that I have access to uh, changing the repeat or changing the motifs or going in and grabbing a particular motif. I have access to all that just by saving the pattern swatch. Um, and then her, her end question is what pattern, uh, what files do, does a client get sent? Um, this depends on the client and is also specific to each client. So I would say not to fret about this until you have a contract and you're licensing artwork and the art director will hopefully walk you through exactly what they want. Um, some companies have, like I, I just did a line of um, iPhone cases for Get Uncommon and they had a, um, like a, what I'm, like a file, they sent me a file with a, uh, what am I trying to say? Like a, a mo like a mock-up almost on it. That's not the right word, but <clears throat> you know something that they wanted me to fill in for them. They already had it set up. Um, I have to set up mill files in a specific way for my fabric collections, but that was all all provided uh, to me by my fabric company. So everything's different, and and I just send them what they want. But usually it's an AI file. It's an AI file. Uh, let's see. Okay, Kate, I see I see that you would like a file on a uh, class on organization. Noted. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, Emma says, your pen lines look so smooth when your drawings are scanned and mine are very bumpy. Can I ask what pen you draw with and your black lines with? Or does it have to do with your scanner settings? Um, I draw, I have a couple of things to tell you about this. I draw with uni pens. Uni pens, that <laughs> spelled U-N-I. And they are on Amazon and they have a bunch of different... Um, widths to them. I don't know if you can see that. But they give a really nice dark black ink line and I tend I tend to sketch in pencil and then if I um, I'm going to go over it to scan in then I'll use a light box and use a pen to perfect my lines before I do that. Um, regarding scanner settings I go over this in class so I don't know if I I can't remember if it's one of the ones that I am making you watch for the workshop or not but it is clearly labeled um, scan like something to do with scanner settings so refer back to class for that and I show you exactly what I do for my scanner settings um, but just on the note of this is probably one reason that my lines look so smooth is not to do with either of those, but is probably to do with that I usually scan in my sketches, lock them as the background, and then trace over them using the blob brush tool and my Wacom tablet. So that provides a really smooth line. And so generally, um, you have to be careful using the live trace tool because if you, I, I think that a lot of people jump to use the live trace tool because it's fast. But really, your sketches have to be perfect in order for you to do that. So it's not really fast if you've done your homework with your sketches and perfected your sketches first. Um, so you either need to perfect your sketches with black and white and a, and a uh, light box in order to use Live Trace, or you need to scan in your images and then trace over them in Illustrator. Um, because I, I can almost always spot out the people who have scanned in their sketches using live trace and just gone with it because it's faster and and it, it doesn't give us a professional look um okay rose says do you have a quick and easy method for making mock-ups um yeah i'm going to refer you also to elizabeth owens class the the last one that she did is on mock-ups and she does a great job explaining um, how to draw your own mock-ups and where to find them online Okay, this is another question from Rose. What is usually your favorite part of a collection? Focal prints, secondaries, fillers, or solids? Um, my favorite part of the collection are focal point prints. And your next question is, which is most difficult for me to design? And I don't know why, but my art director always laughs at me because I find that the simple prints are the hardest for me to design because I have a problem with negative space. I want to fill it, <laughs> and collections need negative space. And so my collections are always, almost, almost always too busy, and I have to go in and water them down um, so that they're not as busy. And um, anyways, that's the hardest thing for me to do. And where do I generally start designing my collections? Um, I don't know exactly what you mean by this, Rose. Where do I start designing my collections? But I am in this workshop basically taking you through the exact same steps that I go through before I start a collection. So I start daydreaming about themes, and then I do take a bunch of photos, and then I write 20 words down about them. I usually come up with a story about them. Um, and then I will start sketching and, and then slowly turning them into illustrated motifs and patterns. So that's how I start is with a kind of an idea then slowly build on it from there. I'm going to check in with you guys over here. Yeah, okay, I've got some from Sarah. Do you have a favorite pattern? And if so, which one is it? <laughs> This always changes. I usually have a favorite pattern for every collection, um, so it always changes. But I, uh, uh, I think my maybe one of my all-time favorite prints are called uh, Orchid Blossom, and they're from my Sweetest Honey collection. 
uh, orchard blossom. And then another favorite though is the one that I used for the um, class image. It's that green bouquet it's called Wild Posy. And it's, it's probably my current favorite because it's not available yet. It's just coming, starting to ship next month. And I think I'm supposed to get my fabric yardage of it this week. So it's my current favorite. In fact, I have it on my, I have an iPhone cover I made from it. <laughs> That's probably my current favorite. But they always change. And then I think I saw another one, Sarah. Which thickness of pen do you use or do you vary it? I vary it, but I tend to use on the thicker side just so that I can ensure if I'm using the black ink pen, usually my goal is to use live trace. And so a thicker line will give me a better live trace. So that's usually um, why I do that. That was from Sheila, sorry. Okay. Um, I got a couple of more questions. Jennifer says, do cer certain colors or motifs tend to sell better than others? Yeah, I think so. And this is not really something that I ever paid attention to. Um, but sometimes I get feedback from my art director of different companies that will suggest my going in a little bit of a different direction, say, um, historically, like light blue has done extremely well. And so some of my best sellers have had a lot of light blue in them. Um, though I don't really give a lot of thought into that when I design. I just kind of design uh, organically and, and go from there. But occasionally when we go back to revisit color stories before we finalize a collection, um, we'll think about this. But I generally let the, I generally let the company kind of um, not change anything, but give me feedback on that so that I don't really have to focus on it because I'd rather just focus on the design work. Maggie says, for learning purposes, I'm trying to use as many ways of creating motifs. For example, live trace sketching, blob brush tool over the sketch, drawing directly into Illustrator with the blob brush pen tool or the brush. Um, and I'm finding that the motifs are all different in style and don't sit together well as motifs. Is this just me or will they look more cohesive over time? I love this question um, because it's nothing that I've ever put into words for any of my classes, but it's absolutely true, Maggie, um, that every approach that you take to your work is going to give you a slightly different result. So in my personal work, I tend to use the same approach for every motif for a particular pattern. Not, necessar not necessarily a whole collection, but for the whole pattern, I will um, say if I'm doing a small um, floral print, then I'll use the same approach to illustrating the motifs for the entire print. And then for the next print, it may be geometrics, so I use illustrator's tools. And then for the next print, it may be um, a really uh, like smooth line brush effect so I use the blob brush tool and the Wacom tablet or whatever but um, it is true that they all give a little bit of a different look and they probably don't look all good all together in the same pattern so I would use the same approach for each pattern and then Mackie also says is it possible to use live trace to return strokes rather than filled shapes and Maggie, I read this earlier, and I, I'm not really sure what you're asking. I don't know if you're here, Maggie, but if you want to clarify, um, and if you're not here, we can, we can uh, answer that in the discussions board. But I'm not really sure what you're asking there. Okay, this is from Elena, um, and we have touched on this a little bit. She says, most designers in the industry seem to be using Illustrator. Are Photoshop and delivering raster files a no-no? I remember you mentioning a signature style will eventually emerge. Um, I'm continually drawn to textural qualities of traditional watercolors, pencil lines, and textures that I can create in Photoshop. Um, okay, so is, and then her question is, could creating raster artwork over vector artwork make it harder to break into the industry? My answer to this is that it depends on the industry. If your goal is to be a fabric designer, it is going to make it harder to break into the industry because, because of the printing. Unless you're doing digital printing like Spoonflower, 
Um, Spoonflower can handle these watercolor, several like thousands of colors, but traditional fabric printing cannot. And so um, you're going to need Illustrator files for that. However, Katie Daisy, as a great example, again, is a watercolor artist, very successful, and uses Photoshop exclusively. And so, it, it, but she doesn't do fabric. She does um, all the other things, <laughs> iPhone cases and uh, greeting cards and stationery and you name it. She just came out with a book even. Um, so it's not that you can't do one or the other. It just depends on which industry you're uh, looking to, to go into. And then some can do both. You could, you could have like a watercolor Photoshop section of your portfolio and also a vector illustrator portion to your for portfolio just to show the range of work that you do. And then who's to say that you um, won't use your illustrator files for a career in fabric design and your Photoshop files for a career in stationary design, um, especially because I've seen your work and I think that you're going great places. <laughs> Um, Jennifer says, is there a standard size we should be creating patterns at? Um, and do you use Pantone? So I think I've already answered both of those questions. Um, is there a standard size you show patterns at? Not really. Um, as long as like if you, okay, so in a portfolio, I generally don't show the patterns at 100% because or what I envision to be a hundred percent because they'll be so large that they can't actually see what is going on in the pattern um, but I do think it's important say if you are presenting a collection in your portfolio that they get a sense for your uh, ability to scale appropriately so say you can um, put all your patterns at a hundred percent and then reduce everything to fifty percent or reduce everything to twenty five percent that will show them that you are paying attention to scale. So you have smaller scales, medium scales, and large scales, but will also let them see um, the full picture so they can really see what your repeats look like. And you could even go as far as to, you know, say somewhere on the page that all patterns are shown at 50% or 25% or something like that. Do you use Pantones? Um, I already talked about that a little bit. I do. I use the Fashion and Home Fan Deck color guide and um, but that's really the very last step um, that is right before I send something to print or to mill I convert to Pantones but in my day-to-day -day illustrating I don't use Pantones I just use colors um, I think let me double check okay I think that's all the questions that were submitted ahead of time let me go through here and see what I haven't answered. Kira, I still feel so novice at using your Wacom. Do you have any suggestions or an online course or reference points for setting up and practicing drawing with the tablet? I really don't. Um, I didn't, um, it's been a long time since I got mine, but I don't really remember having a really hard time with it. However, I will show, I'll tell you how I, I do it. Um, for one, I used to have a bamboo tablet and that was really hard. It did not pick up my strokes like I felt like it should and it was a huge headache. So I don't know what you're working on specifically, but I use a Wacom Intuos Pro um, and have found that it is really organic in the way that it works. And so if you can envision the pad on your Wacom tablet is an exact replica of the screen on your computer. So if you want to start drawing in the bottom left-hand corner, you have to start drawing in the bottom left-hand corner of the Wacom tablet. Um, that will be helpful. The other thing is that I I don't use the buttons on the Wacom. I, I'm sure that some people find them really, really helpful, but I, I don't. I didn't mess with those. I just use it to draw with. And then the other thing that I would suggest is that I bring the, when I'm using the Wacom tablet, I bring it front and center, say where my keyboard is supposed to go. And then I move my keyboard to the left and at an angle so that I can use my left hand for keyboard shortcuts. And then I keep my mouse where it usually is. Um, so I'm drawing and using my left hand for keyboard shortcuts almost seamlessly. And, and that does get take a little bit of getting used to, the keyboard shortcuts and things like that. But if you just stick with it, um, I think that you'll, you know, there's a there's a balance to how zoomed in you should be, and and that's just all trial and error. So I would just say keep going with it, and you'll you'll get there for sure. 
oh, okay, good. Let's see. Maggie is here. Yes, I'm here. The live trace, I'd love it if it gave me a single stroke for the lines, like pen or pencil tool, rather than the shape like the lines of the blob brush tool with points on both sides of the line. Yeah, that does make sense, and that is not the way live trace works. So that's why I don't really suggest using live trace unless you have gone back uh, to your sketches, most likely with a um, light box, and perfected your sketches to a T with a black ink pen because they are not really easily editable after you use the live trace tool. So that's probably why most often I uh, scan in my sketches, lock them, and then trace over them using the pen tool or the blob brush tool because if I don't really love the way a particular curve is going, then I can just correct it um, on top of it, and it didn't matter that my sketches weren't perfect. So, um, yeah, it does not give you anchor points like that. And I'll just throw this in there, too. Um, uh, Mary-Kate McDivitt has done a couple of hand lettering classes here on Skillshare and I took her first one and it's very long and it's so so good if you even if you're not looking to be a hand letterer I fell in love with it because she goes into great depth over um, how she perfects her sketches and she will go over with a light box four and five times the same sketch to perfect it before she scans it in. And she's working in Photoshop, not Illustrator, but the same technique uh, would serve you as well. So maybe if you want to just um, look at her class, so you might enjoy it as well. Um, let's see. Okay, I think I'm up to date on questions. I'm going to pop over and make sure I didn't miss anything on the discussions board. And if you guys want to think of any last minute questions, um, then we will be wrapping up. We, we're just a little over an hour now. So I, I hate that we couldn't see each other. I don't like it being a one, one sided show. <laughs> but the last time I did a Google Hangout, and it, apparently they cap it at 15 students, so only 15 people could get in. Um, Okay, so I'm looking on the discussions board. It looks like a couple of you guys might have had a connectivity issue. Um, Elena, I don't know why you can't access the Q&A chat. Were you able to do that? Um, you have to turn here. Let me see. Somebody maybe can type in how you were able to get to the Q&A. You have to change the little boxes to Q&A from the showcase. So if you're just now figuring that out and have questions, feel free to type them in. OK, there are a couple of questions I missed, so I'm going to answer those. If you need to go, um, that's totally fine, and I am glad that you came. Um, Okay, so Susie says, Bonnie, I have read that files should be at set at 150 DPI, not 300. What do you say? And it always says CMYK. That's a great question and not really something that I pay attention to for surface pattern design. Um, 150 DPI refers to the dots per inch. Uh, so that's more of a Photoshop thing. However, if you're saving uh, something for the web, I do use Illustrator for nearly all my blog posts and pretty much everything that I do. Um, Everything for the web is automatically set to 72, 72 DPI. Um, so even if you upload something at a higher resolution, I'm pretty sure that the web automatically changes it to 72 DPI. Um, for print, say for a magazine feature or something like that, it needs to be 300. So that just makes a larger file though, so I'm not sure if that's why you've heard 150, but 300 DPI for print, 72 DPI for web. And then always CMYK. Uh, CMYK is coloring for print, and then RGB is coloring for the web. Again, I don't really pay a lot of attention to this unless, unless I am sending something to paper print. I'll make sure it's CMYK. But if you're uh, looking to a company or an industry, they should be able to take your files and walk you through that. OK, what else? Okay, I think, let me hop back over to you guys because I can't see you. Yeah, 
You're so welcome. Everybody, you're so welcome. You're welcome. Okay, I think I've answered everybody's questions. If I missed something or you have a follow-up question, just shoot it over to me on the discussions board. And um, that will wrap this up. I think this is going to be available uh, to view later. It's, it's got to upload to YouTube, and I will post a link to it on the discussions board. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and I can't wait to see what you do. Talk to you soon. Bye.